Here I want to tackle a myth about human languages. It's a persistent but nonetheless false myth. The idea that different languages make you think in different ways. This is called linguistic relativism or the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. So we've examined how society can influence a language. For example, if you have a society that distinguishes between older and younger siblings, you would need different words for them. Like in Japanese, onesan and imoto mean older and younger sister. We have also seen examples of how thought or general human cognition can influence language. For example, the syntax of English could create an infinitely long sentence, but there's no way you could remember an infinitely long sentence. As a matter of fact, the limit of your human memory is probably about three CP embeddings. Like in this, uh, this sentence, which is a little bit difficult to understand, the girl that you thought that I said will come tomorrow is eating pizza. It's going to be difficult for you to remember it, not because it's a strange sentence of English, but because your memory cannot cope with all of those embeddings. So these are uh, examples of society and human cognition influencing language. But does the influence go the other way around? Can, does language determine your thoughts? For example, is your L1 language, English or Spanish in my case, a kind of lens that you put on and then you can only understand the world through those lenses, through your words of English or Spanish. That's a very strong hypothesis. There's a weaker equivalent which, uh, which asks, maybe your language influences your thoughts, like the, uh, the words that I have in English or Spanish influence how I perceive the world. In both of these hypotheses, the langu uh, human languages are a kind of crystal that I put in front of my eyes, and they're a way to understand the world. We call this the sapir whorf hypothesis. It's very tempting, and the strong version says that maybe language does determine the way we think, or in the words of one of its creators, that we dissect nature along the lines laid down by our native languages, by the languages we learned when we were babies. It's very in interesting and tempting, but it is false. There's plenty of evidence that uh, our language does not determine the way in which we think. First of all, because if this was true, then there would be no way for us to learn other languages. We could never learn their concepts because we don't have those lenses. For example, let's say I put on my Spanish language lenses, which I understand the world. I go to Denmark and I try to understand the word hügeli, which means comfy or cozy. I hear that word and the only way my mind can understand it is filtering it through the words of Spanish. So whatever I get and whatever ends up in my brain is going to be an incomplete version of what Hügele originally was. However, it's not true that humans learn this way. What humans do to learn things is experience them. If I wanted to learn about true Hügele, I would go to Denmark, get some Danish friends, and then have them uh, ask them to show me somewhere comfy or cozy. And then I would experience a sensory input of feeling comfy, and I would associate that with the label Hügele. That's how humans learn, by experiencing input and associating it to words, not by having their words determine what they can think about. And by the way, notice that people call these untranslatable words, but the translation is right here. So that's one reason why um, this hypothesis has to be false, because even if a language lacks the word for X, it's not true that we cannot express that thought. Like the concept of hügeli is clearly explainable in English, even if we don't have the word for hügeli. But most importantly, if language is determined thought, it would mean that language comes first and thought comes second. But if anything, it's probably the other way around. We have a ton of thoughts that are non-linguistic. So even if we uh, don't have a specific word for something, it doesn't mean that we can't think about it. I'm going to give you two exercises and then I'm going to ask you to pause the video. First of all, define a spiral without using your hands, just with your words. Second, please try to define the feeling you get when someone breaks up with you or when something really sad happens like that. Please pause the video. You can't. Unless you know a lot about, math, uh, about trigonometry and math, defining a spiral is very difficult with your words. But you can define it with your hands. Ooh. It means that your brain knows what a spiral is. It's just that this thought is geometrical in nature. Your, your brain has um, information about what the trajectory should be. It just doesn't have any words for it. So you do have thoughts that don't involve language. Um, likewise, 
I'm sure throughout your life you've had the experience of having feelings that you can't put into words. You feel things first, and then you go to your language for to see what word would be appropriate. Not the other way around. You, you, your feelings are not restricted to the words that already exist in your language. So these are two reasons why it cannot be true that language determines your thoughts. And uh, a third reason is that most of his arguments are based on just like false tales and stories. For example, there's been legends, urban legends for a hundred years that languages like Inuit languages um, and Aleutic languages spoken in Alaska, in Northern Canada, that they have a hundred words for snow. And that this must say something about the way they view the world where they think snow is important and so forth. First of all, these languages don't have 100 words for snow. Um, Yupik, for example, is an Aleutic language from Alaska, and it does have several words for snow, including kanuk, a snowflake, kanek, frost, anu, snow on the ground, and muruanek, a soft snow. So there are different words for snow, but English also has different <laughs> words for snow, like slush, sleet, blizzard, frost, flurry, hail. So it's not about living, it's not about their language making them see more things for snow. It's about both of these languages used in environments that have different different types of snow, and then you would want to describe it because your culture is in contact with snow. So the influence started from your culture into your language, not from your language into your culture. And again, all this is a false story. It's not true that they have a hundred words for snow. As it is not true that English doesn't just has one word for snow. So strong relativism is false. The idea that um, you can only see that your thoughts are determined by your language. How about weak relativism, where your uh, language influences your thoughts? Uh, the jury's still out. For example, there's people who say that speaking a language without a future tense like English or like Mandarin Chinese, will make you save money because they don't have uh, future tense morphemes. So this makes you feel like the present and the future are a single unit and you need to prepare for the future now. Cool story. It's false. Uh, I'll tell you more about it in a moment. But this author basically uh, said that, yes, uh, speaking a language without a future tense makes you save more money. In the end, it didn't turn out to be so. There's authors who say that speaking a language with grammatical gender, like Spanish or German, predisposes you to assign gender features to things in the world. For example, in Spanish, la llave, the key, is a grammatically feminine noun, so speakers of Spanish would say that, it's, that it has stereotypically feminine qualities, like being slender, for example. Whereas speakers of German, where the keys are grammatically masculine, would assign characteristics that are stereotypically masculine, like being sturdy to keys. Uh, maybe this author had the original study that says maybe yes, uh, these authors were, uh, couldn't replicate the effect, so who knows. The problem with these studies is the following. Let me show you a little bit about my stats side by showing you this fun science chart. Imagine you lived in a city where in the first month of your study there were four um, you had about 4,000 ice cream cones being sold and about five shark attacks. On the second month of your study, you have about 11,000 ice creams being sold and about nine shark attacks. And oh my God, on the third month of your study, you have about 16,000 ice creams being sold and about 14 shark attacks. So the more ice cream is sold, the more shark attacks you have. What is the flaw with that reasoning? Please pause the video. flaw of that reasoning is that correlation is not causation, is <laughs> that, yes, mathematically it is true that as you sell more ice cream, there's more shark attacks, but it's because both of these were influenced by a third factor, the fact that July is hotter and therefore you see more ice cream sold and more people in the water, which might lead to more shark attacks. So even though this is mathematically true, it is not true in the real world. There's a third factor influencing it. There's, if you dig deep enough into any data set, you will find weird correlations for, uh, influenced by a third factor. For example, this is from this website, which is amazing, various correlations, and you can see how clearly the more mozzarella cheese is consumed in a society, 
the more civil engineering doctorates you will have. Ergo, if you want a doctorate, eat more cheese. What do you think the problem is with this uh, assertion? Please pause the video. The problem is that both of these things grow with population. If you have more people, there could be more people that eat mozzarella cheese, and there could be more people to gain civil engineering doctorates. So there was a third factor influencing both of them. So even though this is mathematically true, it is it is not true that one causes the other. Mozzarella cheese is not related to getting a doctorate. These studies all have these weaknesses. For example, um, this study, uh, the original one by Chen 2012, did say that speakers of languages without a morphological future save more money, retire with more wealth, smoke less, practice safer sex, and are less obese. Tantalizing story. But when you begin to take other things into account, for example, the, do they speak English um, as a language which doesn't have a morphological future? Do these places have more money because English is spoken in there as opposed to other languages? You can see how the uh, this idea that the future tense is correlated with money starts to dissolve. It's just other factors that are confounded with language. And this is a major problem that we have, that even if this hypothesis is true, it's very difficult to test it. So by the way, if you want to know more about these ideas, these are two very serious linguists that have grappled with the question. Guy Deutscher thinks that indeed um, language does determine how you see the world. And John McWhorter thinks that no, language really doesn't have an influence. But what I do want you to remember is that this idea is called linguistic relativism, or the superior world hypothesis. The idea that language determines, or at least influences, how you see the world. The stronger version of the hypothesis is completely debunked. Because, number one, it is possible to think without language, like in the spiral example. And it is possible to learn concepts that are not in your L1 language. So you don't depend on the filter of English to learn Danish words, for example. You can learn other ways of thinking. Maybe the weak hypothesis is true. I'm a scientist. I'm open to it being true. Uh, but when you do research on this, please be careful when you make do your experiments because correlation is not causation. Even if two things are mathematically related, you need to come up with a compelling hypothesis for why they could be correlated.